Welcome to Firm Foundation. In these times of shifting standards and faulty foundations, there is a solid place on which to build a victorious life. And that place is the Firm Foundation of Jesus Christ and the Word of God. Your host for Firm Foundation is Brian Hudson, a Bible teacher, pastor, author, and producer of Life in Richie Media. All right, today we're going to get into a series, get back to our series with teaching on uh, navigate, and I'm excited about uh, what we're learning in this series because the Lord has certainly given us grace to be led, to follow him, to let others help us, us help others, and together we navigate. So the topic is navigate how to successfully journey through life and these times. And we're looking at these, these subtopics how to navigate personally, financially, relationally, socially, and systemically. I want to tap into today the relational aspect of navigate as we talk about love. In fact, my topic today is the compass of love. Say the compass of love. And this is part four. I want us to see how love helps us navigate, how we help each other to get through life and through circumstances by God's love. Navigation requires fixed points. So we know this, that if you are using your GPS in your car or your phone, there are satellites in space that are fixed points for your device, and the computer figures out where you are based on fixed points. Now, without the technology, we can still use a physical compass that we know there's a magnetic north, all right? And that compass will point that way. And if you know where north is, you can find east, west, and south. Is that right? But in life, I want to suggest there are three navigation fixed points. First is Jesus Christ, of whom the, the Hebrews writer said, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. That's a fixed point. Second, there is the Word of God. I believe the Bible, the Scripture, is God-inspired and God-breathed, and God's truth is a fixed point. Then there's objective truth and facts, like natural science, uh, you know, laws of gravity and some laws of physics. There are things that are fixed points in our world, naturally speaking. And we see a lot of people... Uh, not navigating by Christ, by the word, or by objective truth. Now, objective means it's observable. Opposite of subjective meaning, I feel this way. So w when you say I feel like this, that's subjective. But objective is something that's true apart from you. And what you think about objective truth doesn't matter. What you think about was actually objectively true. Uh, the person said then. Uh, they'll amount to a hill of beans in a 40-acre field, okay? So, we, we, so people have made mistakes, even Christians, by not respecting objective truth and natural science. And we see this happening in the whole realm of COVID, people not getting vaccinated because they're afraid of something. They, they say, well, you know, they give you some other reason, but it's basically fear. It's fear keeping them from doing what they should do. So then people are suffering and dying needlessly in some cases, in many cases. So let's understand that to navigate life, Jesus, the word of God, objective truth and facts, maybe more than those three, but those three come to my mind. Today, let's talk about love. Say love. First John chapter four. And this is, we call John the apostle of love, some have said. Reading from the fourth chapter, verse seven. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. In this, the love of God was manifested toward us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. Say, Lord, thank you. We can live through you. When I read that, I thought about, we could also say we navigate through you. 
right? So when we say we live through God, we navigate through him because living is about getting through life and managing life's circumstances. And so we see that love helps us, love of God helps us navigate and live through him. Now, I thought about this when I was driving into to the um, service today, and this scripture came to my mind from 2 Corinthians. It's not on the screen, but 2 Corinthians 5, 14 says, Christ's love constrains us. Since we believe that Christ died for all, we also believe we have all died to our old life. NIV, or actually the uh, New Living Translation says, Christ's love controls us. The word constrain means control. Again, a navigation type of a term. Now, there are cars out here. Uh, Tesla, Cadillac has one, where the car will, it will drive itself. It'll drive itself, autonomous. And you sit there. Now, they want you to keep your hands close to the wheel, keep your eyes forward. I know the Cadillac actually looks at your face. And if you look away, the car goes out of automatic and makes you grab the wheel again, some kind of way. But uh, <laughs> I can't imagine that, you know. Uh, it, it's, but the point is, point is, when you have that level of technology in a car, where the car takes you from point A to point B, that's some serious, serious navigation going on. And you're being constrained or controlled by the navigation system of the car. Now, in my mind, I like to think that that's how Christ helps me. Even though we have to make choices and decisions, the more you yield to him, the more he helps you. And the more you say, Lord, I got it, he said, you got that? You think you got that? <laughs> you find out you don't got it. The more you think you got it, you don't have it. And so the more we yield to Christ, now, I'm not saying Jesus does things for you. I'm not saying you have to, he'll balance your checking account for you, you know. I'm not saying he'll go to work for you and do your job well for you. I'm not saying that. But he will lead you to the right place. He'll lead you where you need to go so you can do what needs to be done. Amen. Right? I mean, he'll, he, you're the horse that he leads to the water. We are the horse he leads to the water. But guess what? You got to do the drinking. So that's the context of how he controls us. And so he says, Christ's love constrains me. His love. How does love do that? That's the whole point today. How does love help us navigate? I love again, I love that, uh, that verse again, last part where it says that, that we might live through him. Say, Lord, thank you. I am living through you. Now just meditate on that, okay? Work with that. Uh, because that's a simple statement with many facets to it, that we might live through him. What does it look like? What, is it, what does it look like? How do we, how do we master that? And that's, that's really the reason why we gather for worship, why we have devotional prayer, we read the Bible, we study the word, you know, we, we follow examples because we're learning how to live through him. One thing I know is, is that for us, we're not naturally inclined to follow and serve God. Human nature is not naturally inclined that way. So we do something called obedience. We do something called pay attention. We, we, we listen to Christ. We obey the word. We're doers of the word, not hearers only. And so the love that we have compels us to take the right actions. For example, those of us who have spouses and children, uh, other loved ones, you know how it is. It's, it's the love that someone has for you that dictates what you actually do. There are things you do and don't do because you love somebody. So that's why the church sign out there, we put a banner that says, love your neighbor as yourself, get vaccinated. Ultimately, we do things because we love one another. If we base everything on what I feel, what I want, that's a recipe for a big mess. And, with, and listen, in, in my years of ministry, and, in, and I, I do some counseling, not a whole lot, but I'm a, I teach the word. This is counseling right now, what I'm doing now. So it's like I don't counsel people who don't sit in front of me to hear the word. I'm not doing that. 
Because what I do, I'm called to do this. To go in a room and counsel somebody is, is not my primary calling. And amen, somebody. Y'all all right? Now, I'm saying it to say all the members of the church, I'll counsel you. But, you know, but there are people who have a calling to counsel. You, you know, you sign up, you pay a fee and go in the room and sit in there. And they help you. But when you minister the word, then it's, it's not just, you know, talking to somebody across the desk. It is learning how to live through him. Because yeah. ultimately, a lot of problems we have amount to you're not living through him. You're living through some, your, your mind, your, your feelings and all that, through what somebody told you, read in a book, you saw on TV. I heard years ago somebody said, you've got to pray for Jane. Because Jane ha is having issues with her husband. Well, Jane was a character on the soap opera. Now, you know somebody lost their mind when they asked for prayer for Jane. On the but th that's how far deep people are into you know, a different life. We have to live through him. Say live through him. <laughs> we have to learn to live through him. Now, what is love? Let me have you skip to the next slide that shows the compass. I kind of got my slides backwards here. So what is love? Love is a compass. Say love is a compass. Now, here's a physical compass. You may have seen one before. You may have used one before. Nowadays, we have electronic compasses. But that's a compass, all right? And again, the purpose of a compass really is one purpose, is to let you know which direction is north. Where is north? That's the main purpose of a compass. And so when you, uh, when the compass is, the compass always points north. So when you turn the compass, then the, the dial underneath the arrow moves. The dial stays the same. The dial keeps pointing north. So when you turn yourself and hand in the compass, then you know from north if I'm going east, west, or south. Love is like that. Love is that constant due north. Love is that, is that always correct direction. Love is the always correct direction. Say love is love. the always, always correct, correct direction. Now go back to the slide before that again. So what is love? Love is a compass. We know what John 3, 16 says. Say it, please. For God, that, yes, should not perish but have everlasting life, right? So basically, you know, defining love is not difficult. It's beyond just word definition because we have the example of what God did through Christ. So that text tells you everything essential that you need to know about the love of God, or we can also call the God kind of love. And there are four important ingredients to the God kind of love. I'm contrasting against the world's kind of love, right? God's love is not like the world around us. First is love is universal and not selective. Say love is universal, love is universal. and not selective. Second, love is sacrificial and not selfish. Say that. Love is sacrificial and not selfish. Third, love gives and doesn't take. Say that. Love gives and doesn't take. And finally, love leads to safe places. Say that. Love leads to safe places. Let's look at the world's kind of love. Let's contrast God's love, the God kind of love, to the world's kind of love. And we find it quite opposite that the worldly kind of love is narrow and highly selective, right? While God's love is universal and not selective, the world's love is narrow and highly selective. Number two, uh, the world kind of love is stingy. Stingy and selfish. <laughs> Stingy and selfish. Sometimes you see children, you know, children uh, just have no filters, you know, and they, they, they're growing up and learning. But you ask child for something, they'll give you little, the smallest piece of something. You know what I'm saying? They're going to give you a little bit, little, the smallest piece of something. They'll give you one little piece of something. 
Then you have to be trained. No, you give, no, you give more than, come on, another piece. You, you train, we are naturally just stingy. Because we're naturally in our own flesh. Number three, the worldly kind of love is motivated by selfish gain. Even what is done for you is done by the motivation. I'll, I'll get something back from you out of this that I'm doing for you. Even marketing sometimes does that. They, you know, they give you a little small something for the exchange for email address. And by the way, just so you know, if you give up your email address for some little free gift, two things. Don't forget, the trip on the slave ship was free. All right? Number two is when you give your address up, they sell your address. They sell your address. And so you get other emails from other people because you gave them your address and they're making money off your address you gave them. Everybody knows that, right? Y'all know it, don't they? Where all this spam come from? So I always tell you, create for yourself a junk email address. Or if they demand an address, give them a fake one. Like Starbucks says, you know, to get online, I give them an address. I give them a fake one, and I'm online. But I, you lied. I didn't lie. No, 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 no. I gave them a email address. Because I don't want you to email me anything. I just want to be online and drink this coffee. <laughs> Say navigate. navigate. Don't be simplistic with people. Don't act like people aren't trying to play you. Come on, somebody. So play them back. They play them. If they try to play you, play them back. Go up a different level. Because... People are taking advantage of your, of your niceness and your openness and all this kind of stuff. And uh, I'm not saying you shouldn't be nice and open, but, but you know, you ought to know who, to whom you owe things. I don't owe Starbucks nothing. They got my money. I paid for the coffee. That's all you need from me. I want to be online. You got coffee, money. You got overpriced coffee money. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you got more than you should have got. <laughs> so you don't get my email address on that. No, no, you're not getting that. And if you, and so if you can't fake it, then just make a, make a Yahoo or a Gmail up. All I'm saying is sometimes when you navigate life, you have to really just be rational about it, a little bit hard-nosed about it sometimes. Because your privacy is worth protecting. Yes. Amen. It is. It is. All right. So then the world's uh, kind of love, again, narrow, highly selective, stingy and selfish. Number three, motivated by selfish gain. And number four, the best interests of others is not in view. The world's kind of love often doesn't have your best interests in view. Not at all. All right. Now, Jesus called love the first and great commandment. Mark 12, 28. One of the teachers of religious law was standing there listening to the debate. He realized that Jesus had answered well. So he asked, of all the commandments, which is the most important? They always thought they would get Jesus and catch him in error. And he was thinking, well, of the Ten Commandments, which is the best? But Jesus didn't cite the Ten Commandments. Watch, he said, Jesus answered, verse 29, the most important commandment is this. Listen, O Israel, the Lord our God is one and is the one and only Lord. And you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And the second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. No other commandment is greater than these. Now, what they maybe have missed is Jesus was quoting from Leviticus chapter 19. Because that's where, that's where the scripture first said, 
Love your neighbor as yourself. It actually is an Old Testament scripture. Love God and love your neighbor. And so the, he, he, he challenged them. Maybe the guy who asked the question knew that answer already. I don't know. But Jesus made it clear that the great commandment is not what you think it is. Think it is. It's not a commandment you get to, to bind people with. The great commandment binds you to love God. The great commandment enjoins you to love your neighbor as yourself. So they tried to catch him. They always failed trying to trick Jesus with these, with these questions. Now, how we relate to and navigate with others is one of the most important skills of life. Entire books and courses are dedicated to how to relate to others. All this is good, but walking in love is the most helpful. So we understand in our personal relationships, my topic today is talking about relationally uh, navigating, relationally navigating. Uh, that's all great. We've heard many sayings and speeches and read books. That's all great. But for Christ followers, the most important factor is walking in love. Say walking in love. In fact, it's so important that James called this the royal law. James 2 verse 8 says, yes, indeed, it is good when you obey the royal law. As found in the scriptures, love your neighbor as yourself. Again, Leviticus 19. So when James said scripture, he's referring to the Old Testament. And it does say right there in the law, love your neighbor, even though the people could not walk in that. They lacked the spiritual life to live it out, but it was there in the word a long time ago. So then the royal law is the most important factor to how we treat others. That is the golden rule, right? Same thought where uh, do unto others as you have them do unto you. It's not scripture, but it's a very good saying, and it's a good principle that if I'm walking in love toward people, that I'm going to be able to relate to them properly. I mean, even enemies. Because, see, you can love an enemy and, the, and not let them play you. Love is not some wishy-washy, weak thing. Amen? You love your child, and you spank them anyway. Amen. They still got a spanking. Yeah. I love you. Yeah, okay, I love you too. Here we go. It's time. So, so you can't... Let people play you on this thing of love because love is not what people think it is. Love has many levels to it. And there's a part of love that has to do difficult things, hard things. And, and so love isn't always smiley, touchy feeling. Uh, love sometimes can be very stern. But the motivation behind it is to help, to lead, as when we said earlier, love of God leads people to a safe place, right? And so sometimes to lead people to a safe place, you have to be a little firm with them because they're in a bad place. And they're stuck in that bad place. They, they keep gravitating to that bad place. So love has to literally pull them away from it, some kind of way, pull them out and help them to know that, no, this is not good for you. And it, listen, when you do that, we, we hope people get the message. You can't, <laughs> we can't be around people all the time. And, and pull them out of bad situations. Now, that, that love does this. Listen, love will sometimes let people suffer the consequences of their decision. Sometimes love does that too. I'm not stepping in here. Even God does that sometimes with us. Let us suffer the consequences of a bad decision. The old saying is, whatever don't kill you makes you stronger. <laughs> And that, that, it shouldn't come to that level, but sometimes, you know, we act so foolish, no, no other message gets through. Nothing else gets through sometimes than, than people having to suffer behind a bad decision. So next time, they'll make a better decision. So that's, that's a hard, but love will let us learn that way. We let children, our children, we've had cases and times where have let children suffer, our own kids, whom we give our lives for, you know, and want them to do well, not make mistakes. But you can't, you can't live through life. You can't get through, you can't navigate life with people 
exempting you from mistakes. We've all made mistakes and suffered consequences of bad decisions. But the key is we don't make the bad decision twice. On that happy point, I'll move on. <laughs> Since y'all shouting me down. Don't shout me down and the preacher's so good. <laughs> All right. God's love changed your character. Look at 1 John 3. Say, God's love changed my character. 1 John 3 verse 1 says, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God. God's love changed our character. We went from being just sinners and people lost to becoming children of God, adopted into the family of God. God's love, the love that sent Jesus Christ to die for our sins, buried, rose again, that same love that called us under conviction and we responded to the call and then saved us. Now we are called children of God. That manner, that, that kind of love, that manner of love, you see. And that's how we, and we want to really reflect back to others what God has reflected to us. And so the manner of love that we have now that gave us new character, we can now show the same love to others around us. But again, that love is not soft. That love is, is not going to be played. You can't play God can't play God's people. You cannot play the true love of God. You know, had a guy come by last month. We were in here doing some work, and he came by talking about he wants some money. I said, we're not giving cash out. You're supposed to be a church. You're supposed to be a preacher. Oh, yeah, we're a church and a preacher. You ain't getting no money. He walked away cussing. Who, who, who got the problem here? You know what I'm saying? So you're going you're gonna to play me. You're supposed to be at church. So, okay, so I'm going to run and get some money because you said that? I'm going to run, go to the bank and go to the teller and get you some. No, I ain't, I'm not going down the street. You know, I didn't say that. I just said what I said. He walked on and walked away mad. Because people want to play you. They're smiling. Oh, can you, can you give me something? No, I can't do that. Oh, what's wrong with you? You know, now, I do believe in giving to people. I'm very generous. But you have to know when you're being played. Say this, I won't let people play me. Say, so you, you can't play God, and you won't play me. So just be mad and go on. <laughs> go on, go on. Make it one word, go on. Because there's somebody who appreciate what you do for them. One time, it was in Cleveland at a conference, and a guy asked for money. I said, well, you know what? You can, uh, I, I need, you can shine my tires on my car. Oh, great, I'll do that. Great, thank you. I gave him my, my armor all. He shined, I gave him $20 for it. You know what I'm saying? So, so you know, we don't want to reject people who ask. Just put them to a little test. And the best test is to say no and then check the reaction. And then you may feel, okay, I'll help them anyway because they didn't act a fool when I said no. <laughs> I mean, just think, I'm talking about real living, y'all. I'm talking about navigating. I'm talking about real life stuff. Not just smiling at people and over smiling. Love keeps you out of envy, which has ruined relationships. Cain envied his brother, envied his brother Abel. Watch this, 1 John 3, 11. For this is the message that you heard from the beginning, that we should love one another, not as Cain, who was of the wicked one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his works were evil and his brothers were righteous. And this is a sad, this is called fratricide. It's the first fratricide. Sibling killing sibling in the Bible. And it's amazing what he killed his brother over because God said, bring me an offering. 
And Abel went and among his flocks and found his best animal and brought that to God. Whereas Cain went and grabbed, grabbed some stuff out the ground, just grabbed some weeds out the ground, grabbed something and brought it to God. And I said, I don't want this. And, and so when, when Cain saw that God received Abel's offering, Cain became envious and jealous. But God said, wait a minute. If you do the right thing, I'll receive you too. So God gave me a chance to go just take that junk back and bring me a correct offering. You know, God knows what he wants. You know, God has this problem. He thinks he's God. Don't bring God any junk. Don't bring God a little. So, so rather than, you know, go and search his flock, he just grabbed the first thing he saw, took it to God. That's what Cain did. But Abel took time to bring God a good offering. And, and so this is, this is the reason, this is actually the reason why Cain killed his brother. Because he was, he was angry at the response, the good response God gave to Abel, and the poor response God gave to him. Isn't that sad? Isn't that sorry? But human nature is, is like that. So then, God's love will change our character. And God's love will help us stay out of envy. You know, envy, here's what envy is. You can check yourself on it. Check ourselves on it. All right. I'm not envious. I'm not jealous. Okay, let's, let's, let's see here. Let's see here. Let's see here. Oh, okay, okay here's one. Uh, let someone roll up in a brand new car. And how do you feel about that? Now, look up definition of envy, jealousy. It, it, it's, it's to feel pain at the success of another. Feel some kind of way, we'll say, I'll say. So why would you have a bad feeling about somebody else doing well? Yeah. New car, new job, new wife, new husband, new, what, you know what I'm saying? New pair of shoes, whatever, new purse. And now you got like, oh, oh, oh man, look at that. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> and that's the same thing that, 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 that's the spirit of Cain. Now, now, it don't lead to murder always, but there's something called a spirit of murder. Well, you wish somebody was out of your life, out of your face, out of your whatever, because they got, they got this going on. You don't have it going on. And that's, that breaks up relationships, even. It can hurt friendships, marriages. So we should rejoice when somebody does well. Because you know what? When you rejoice at that, you really open the door for yourself to be blessed. And besides that, you know what? You don't necessarily want what somebody got. That's called covetousness. That's another problem. Let's not get into that, y'all. Envy is like the spirit of Cain. You don't want to ever let envy in your heart. Just walk in love. See, love will help us avoid envy. Just rejoice with people. Amen. Rejoice and pray for them because they got debt now. Come on, somebody. Amen. That's nice. It's debt. Expensive. How much they cost? What do they cost? Yeah, you know it's expensive. Cars cost a lot nowadays, y'all. They cost crazy. I mean, nowadays, they're in short supply. Even used cars cost like new cars now. So you who got old paid off cars, y'all yeah. just rejoice and be happy. <laughs> if it's running good, look okay, you be happy. You be happy with your car, amen? Don't worry about these new shiny cars. All right, watch this now. So then, let's go to more detail here. So then, uh, next point here is doing for others will allow the love of God to activate in us. And working from the scripture, dealing with we love not in word but deed and truth, okay? So doing for others will allow God's love to activate in us. There are things in us, saints, that are not activated. For example, we all have grace to minister to people, to preach to people, to preach the gospel to people, we have, we have oftentimes wisdom in us, and for a lack of use, these things aren't activated. And sometimes the love of God in us isn't fully activated because we don't do for others. Number two, sometimes we don't act on the abilities that we have. Just made that point. Next, love does not come, does not come naturally. And then... I heard Dr. Benjamin say this years ago. He preached and said, the natural man is a natural mess. 
heard you say that years ago. The natural man is a natural mess. And so that we want to really press into the character of Christ, into the love of God. Because in ourselves, we're just going to make a mess of things. So these are important words that we need to take hold of. Next point here. We sometimes use words when we should be taking action. All right. So um, let me see. First. John 3.16, again, John is the apostle of love, we often call him. By this we know love, because he laid down his life for us. And we ought also lay our lives down for the brethren. Whoever has this world's good and sees his brother in need, and shut up the bowels of his heart from him, bowels of compassion is King James, but shut up the heart, his heart from him, how does love of God abide in him? And verse 18 says, my little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Now, it's good to say to somebody, I love you. It really is good and very encouraging. Sometimes we use words when we should be taking action. That's what I'm saying. Not just gifts, but what we actually do for one another. Please understand that. We use words we sometimes should be taking action he said, let us not love, look at that, let us not love in word or in tongue. Don't love like that. He said, love how? In deeds and truth. Let's finish up here. All right, now love causes light to shine on your path as well as on the path of the one you love in deed and truth. Now watch this. Let's go to 1 John 2. Go back to 1 John 2. We're going to close here on these points. Verse 7, the Apostle John said, Behold, I write no new commandment to you, but an old commandment, which you have heard or which you have had from the beginning. What's he saying? Well, he's saying, I'm not saying something new. He says, I'm saying something old. And that is Leviticus 19. Love God Love your neighbor. That's what he's talking about, the old commandment. Watch this. So the old commandment is the word which you have heard from the beginning. He just said, I write no new commandment. He says, then he said, a new commandment, I write to you. What's he saying? What he's doing here, he's emphasizing something that's old in a new way. Right? Sometimes things that are old, we forget about those things. We lose sight of those things. I mean, folk probably thought it was Jesus who said, love your neighbor as yourself. He, went, he didn't say that. It was, Moses wrote that in Leviticus. So, so John is bringing back to the remembrance of the people. Uh, he's, so his new commandment is actually restating the old one, right? Bringing back to the memory the old one. He says, which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away, and the true light is already shining. He who says he is in the light and hates his brother is in darkness until now. Right? So we can't go around saying, uh, if you hate somebody, you're, you're in darkness. Even though you're in Christ and light in you, people with light in them can walk in darkness. Say it again. People with light in them can walk in darkness. Now, they'll be under conviction. They'll be corrected for it by the Spirit of God. But it, it happens because sometimes people hate other people. Now, he says really hate his brother, referring more to a fellow believer in Christ. Uh, but no, no Christian hates other. Come on. Nobody hates other, other Christians. Come on now. I don't hate. All right, wait, here, here I go now. How do you define hate? Strong dislike. So do you dislike them? Yeah. Strongly? Yep. That's hate. Just so you know, right? As my Angelou said, when well, you know better, do better. Because some folks are in hate because it's strong dislike. And that keeps a person walking in darkness. Now, I don't know what that means exactly. But it couldn't be good. Now, I don't believe people, you know, become unsaved behind that. 
But certainly, you know how it is, we get clouded sometimes. We lose our way sometimes. Not because of Christ, but because we haven't obeyed Christ, haven't walked the path. Then he says this, verse 10. He who loves his brother abides in the light, and there is no cause for stumbling in him. Now, I read this in many translations. I'm not clear, really, on who it's referring to when it says no cause for stumbling in him. Is him the person who is loving his brother? Or is him the person being loved? Because it says here, he who loves his brother abides in the light. There's no cause for stumbling in him. So is it, is it the person loving or his brother who doesn't stumble because you walk in love? I just say both. I believe that if I walk in love toward, toward Elder Owens, then I help him abide in the light. And there's no occasion for stumbling for me or him. Right? When you shine a light, everybody gets to benefit from it. So I don't quibble over the subject of this, this verse. I just know that if we love and walk in the light, nobody's going to stumble. Amen. We can all walk straight. We can see where we're going. We can see obstacles in front of us. We can help each other navigate. That's a good navigation term right there. So light helps you see where you're going. Example, I want to share with you on this point, illustration. All right. Imagine having a flashlight that has not been used, but it still has power, hasn't been used for a long, long time. Well, the flashlight is like the old commandment to love. It's in the drawer. We haven't used it, but it's there. Well, so getting the flashlight, getting the flashlight and bring it out, that now it's new commandment. Once I go get the old and use it, then it, to me, it's new, right? And using that flashlight for myself and others is like walking in love. So if we're in a dark place and I find this flashlight, I'm holding it. I can see where I'm going, and you can see too. We all can see. When somebody has light, everybody can see. Amen. That's good, isn't it? So then this is the light that shines on our path and on the path of the one that you love in deed and truth. Amen. Father, thank you for reminding us, Lord, of how love is one of those, the most important component to how we navigate a fixed point in our lives. And Lord, thank you that as the Apostle John so often said, that Lord, because we love you, we know you, and that those uh, who don't love don't know you because you are love. But Lord, we do love you. We do know you because we walk in love. And that love walk makes us stronger in our walk with you. It helps us navigate with others, helps us to help others, helps us to to uh, manage shortcomings in ourselves and others, gives us mercy for the mistakes, Lord, that we, we, that we witness, that others do and we do. And this environment of love, Lord, is such a safe place to navigate. And yet, Lord God, at the same time, we do not uh, let foolishness and, and foolish people play us and, and play on that love. And, and, and Lord, we, 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 we're yet firm in that because love also... Lord, we'll let people understand what you want from them and what we have to do or not do with their concern because we love you first and your love dictates how we walk with others and if we walk with them at all. Lord, thank you for...